who's ready to learn about some perennial vegetables? Yeah. Woo! Um, like Diego said, my name's Taylor Walker. I'm with Green Dreams. We're an edible landscaping and permaculture design company out of Spring Hill, Florida, about 30 miles north of Tampa. We have about a six-acre farm in that area where we're doing a lot of research with perennial crops and a lot of different fruit trees. Um, let's get started here. This actually is a picture of our farm here, and a lot of the stuff we're doing is, uh, is perennial. We are doing some other uh, some tropical annual vegetables too, but this is one of our, our growing areas. Perennial vegetables for profit. So what is a perennial vegetable? You know, we, all, we always hear about vegetables, we hear about annuals, and you hear about perennials. What truly is a perennial? A perennial is a plant that lives for one or more years. You know, most annual plants are planting have to be planted every, you know, every month, every two months. They're a quick turnover crop. Perennial plants are plants that are planted typically one time every few years, or some, in some cases, one time, you know, for a lifetime. So perennial plants live for one or typically two or more years, so they're longer-lived species. What are some benefits of perennial vegetables? Okay, so perennial vegetables have a lot of benefits in my mind, and you know, here, we're here at Permaculture Voices, and a big thing in the permaculture system is, is food forestry. Perennial vegetables are an essential part of a perennial polyculture or a food forest system. They just really fit well into that uh, style of management. Um, perennial vegetables also have, have a huge role in building soil and increasing soil organic matter, and therefore increasing the soil carbon content which is, you know, this, all this carbon farming we're talking about, you know, perennial vegetables play a huge role in that sequestration of soil carbon. Um, perennial vegetables are also much more resilient in the face of extreme weather and climate change. A lot of these crops have adapted in regions that have more extreme weather, and because of the nature of the crops, they're more resilient to, you know, droughts, to flooding, fires, hurricanes, these type of things. So that's really important with our extreme weather situations we've been having in the last, you know, 50 or 60 years here in the US. Um, perennial vegetables also typically are more nutritious. Some of the most nutritious vegetables in the world, or actually the two that I'll talk about today are you know, two of the most nutritious crops on earth. They're, they're more nutritious than annual vegetables because they have more of a wild origin. They're less domesticated. A lot of the annual vegetables have been selected for certain characteristics so many times because of that rapid turnover, they can be selected multiple times in a year in certain warm growing regions, there's been a lot of domestication with annual vegetables, and they've lost some of their medicinal components and some of their nutritive components. So perennial vegetables, because they're less domesticated, typically have a lot more um, medicinal components and a lot more mineral and nutrient components. Also, because they're perennial, their plants are growing larger, they're growing much more expansive root systems, and they're able to bring in minerals and nutrients from further out in the soil and accumulate those into the plant matter. So that's another reason they're so much, you know, in my opinion, superior to annual vegetables. So basically, there's a few different categories of perennial vegetables, and any type of vegetable, any of these categories can be fulfilled with the perennial. So um, leaves and flowers, um, fruits that we'd consider more of like a vegetable, you know, like a tomato is truly a fruit, but it's, it's a vegetable. So there's a lot of perennials that are, that are fruits, um, beans and seeds. Um, the, one of my favorite ones are the roots and rhizomes. So a lot of the best perennial vegetables are root crops. And spices and herbs are another category of perennial vegetables. Here's a picture of one of our properties that's mostly a, a perennial garden here, and that's after a year. Florida, we have very uh, high rainfall, very warm weather. Stuff grows extremely fast. So a lot of these perennial vegetables also are very fast growing, so you're going to get a high return on your investment. And they're easy to grow. You know, we can go plant an annual garden for a client, come back three months later, it's ruined. We did this for the guy, came back a year later, and you can't even see the house anymore. It's just completely a jungle, and it's all food. And a lot of them are, the, you know, like I said, some of the most nutritious crops on earth. So sweet potato. All of you have had sweet potato. My favorite perennial vegetable is sweet potato. Um, in Florida, that's kind of a, a staple. You know, all the old homesteaders in Florida had sweet potatoes growing. You have your potato patch. One part that a lot of people don't know about sweet potatoes is acre per acre, it's the most nutritious crop on earth because the sweet potato leaves are edible and highly nutritious and are a staple crop in a lot of parts of the world, especially Southeast Asia and Africa. And the roots themselves are one of the most nutritious crops as well. So they have one of the highest vitamin A contents, great source of carbohydrates, on and on. 
But another thing that's not commonly known about sweet potatoes is the immense diversity of the roots, the colors, the textures, the sweetness levels, so they can be very diverse in their taste and their uses. Most of us have had the traditional orange sweet potato. Um, to me, those are very limited in their use when you're talking about uh, adapting that to a, you know, more of a daily use or a staple crop. So we have so many different types of sweet potatoes growing that are all you know, so different and so diverse. Some of them are much more starchy um, and a drier flesh that can be used more like an Irish potato. Um, they can be great for making flowers out of and breads, those varieties. We have purple varieties that are very dense. I almost call them meaty. They're very filling, um, a world away from an orange sweet potato. So this is one crop that is so easy to grow um, and just should be planted more often. So we use it as a ground cover in a lot of our farm. It's not the perfect perennial ground cover because you do harvest the roots. But we found through certain methods of harvesting, we're not totally depleting you know, the soil. So we call it spot harvesting. But we're harvesting in patches and leaving patches intact. You could go in and clear out the whole field and pull out all the sweet potatoes, but you're going to you know, heavily disturb the soil. So by spot harvesting and harvesting early enough in the season where we can allow the vegetation to grow back, we're not really causing very much soil disturbance or weed growth. So here's a picture of some of the different varieties we're growing. I think we have about 15 varieties right now of sweet potato, and there's, there's so many. There's hundreds and hundreds of varieties out there. Sand Hill Preservation is a source for... They have the most sweet potato varieties. I think they have 160 varieties available. So if you want to get some of these varieties, check out Sand Hill Preservation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the numbers on sweet potato. It's a very high yielding crop. They can yield up to 40,000 pounds per acre, in some cases uh, much more in, in a rare occasions. Um, typically in Florida, it's harvested in the summer and fall, but it really can be harvested any time of the year, as, you know, as long as you have between 100 and 150 days from planting. Um, the leaves can be harvested at any time the vines mature enough that you're not going to you know, deplete its foliage. Um, the price of sweet potato is not the highest price. It's more of a, you know, I'd say almost a commodity. It's, it's commonly available. But some of the specialty types, like the all-purple varieties or some of the white types or pink flesh, those can fetch a lot higher dollar. They can get $3 or even sometimes $4 a pound, especially to restaurants and direct sale, um, where a lot of your more standard varieties are going to fetch more like a dollar or $2 a pound. Um, you know, since we are an edible landscaping company and a nursery, we do a lot of uh, plant propagation as well. So when we get these unique varieties, we want to distribute these and, and grow these more. So we typically uh, harvest sweet potatoes in the fall, keep them over during the winter and the spring, and then we plant out sweet potatoes in, in, in the early spring for slips. And slips are basically rooted cuttings. And slips of some of these rare varieties sell for a dollar or more a piece. So it's literally a little piece of the plant for a dollar. And you just put the potatoes in a, in a bucket or put them in a, an area in the ground, and when the, when the new sprouts come up, you harvest those sprouts, and those are the slips. So the main you know, big suppliers of sweet potatoes are, are disease-free, certified, and, and, and these kind of things. But you know, for planting for our clients and for our uses, it's a very simple method. And if, as long as we're not shipping the slips, there's very little certification required. It's, it's a very you know, awesome crop to get into. Um, very low level of entry for this, for this crop. So malanga is another perennial root crop. This one's really popular in the Caribbean and uh, Central America, South America. It's very similar to taro, which is in the same family, and it's more of the Hawaiian staple crop, the Polynesian staple crop, but malanga is kind of like a dryland taro, so it can grow in uh, more dry soils. It does like a higher organic content in the soil, and the cool thing about malanga is it's a great understory plant, and it can grow in shady conditions and produce a root crop, which is unusual for a lot of these, a lot of these species. So malanga is typically eaten as like a potato substitute. So you peel the root, you boil it, you fry it, you bake it, you know, make soups, all these type of things. So you're typically growing them along from what's called a cormel, which is like a side tuber that comes off. And when that grows up into a main, like the large tuber is called a corm. And those are usually harvested after about 10 months of planting. And they can be harvested earlier, but usually you want to wait until that, that plant starts to go dormant. So they go dormant in the fall the leaves start to reduce in size and the plant starts to die down. They don't fully freeze out where we are, but by the time usually January comes around, they're pretty fully dormant. So uh, we harvest it at that time. They're not the most valuable crop, but they have a great function as they can grow in an understory in a tropical setting and produce you know, a great starch crop. So usually they're around $2 a pound. In some of the organic specialty markets, you might get a little bit more for them, direct sales to restaurants. And um, the cool thing, though, for us, they're not a very valuable crop, but they're a beautiful landscaping plant and a great uh, you know, dooryard garden, we call it, like a home, homeowner crop. So 
we can take out a Cormel, which would, you know, we might get 50 cents for selling it as a food product, plant it, and in three months have a $15 plant that we can sell. And they look just like an, an elephant ear, which is a common ornamental plant planted around. But they're, some of them are more, more beautiful. They have black stems, they have blue leaves, um, you know, really beautiful plants, and they're edible. So um, we find this one's you know, better suited for us as a, a nursery plant to really sell. There's not as high of a demand for it as sweet potato. It's not as productive. But you know, people love growing and eating it still. So we, we do a lot of production with that for our nursery. Cassava is one that all of you have had too, but you may not know it as cassava. You've probably all had tapioca pudding, and that's a product of the cassava starch that's been extracted and processed into this pudding. Um, cassava is the easiest crop to grow I've ever grown. You literally can take the steaks, they're, they're woody cuttings, and you can use a mallet and mallet them into the ground, like a tent stake, and you plant your field that way. They're, you can just stick them into the worst soil with almost no organic matter, very little water, and they, they do excellent. They can go six months without water once they're established and do great. So it's, it's, it's pretty much the staple food of, of the tropics and a lot of the uh, you know, arid tropics throughout the world as well. And it takes about nine months to harvest cassava. Some varieties are, are quicker, like seven months or six months. Some varieties take longer, up to 14 months. So cassava overall doesn't really compare to sweet potato and nutrient content. It's a great source of carbohydrates. But overall, it's just a great a staple food. It's very easy to process, very easy to harvest. It doesn't have a very long shelf life, though, so it's typically something that's harvested and processed right away. The roots themselves typically deteriorate within you know, two days to a week after, after harvesting, where sweet potatoes can last for 12 months in storage. So cassava is often processed into flours and paste and uh, fermented immediately to, to increase that, that storage life. So... For our nursery, we're typically just selling cassava cuttings. We found that um, planting out cassava plants and trying to sell those, they don't do great. A lot of these plants that you take from big woody cuttings typically need to get planted out into the ground faster, into a big container. They want to grow quickly. So we've, we've done the nursery stock with them, and it hasn't really worked for us. They're growing too fast. You've got to keep cutting them back. You have a six-foot plant and a one-gallon pot in like two months in Florida. So we're typically, when we're doing plantings, we're just selling cuttings. So we'll go out there and the clients are you know, pissed off. You just put 20 sticks in the ground. You know, that was 100 bucks for that, 20 sticks. You come back in three months and you know, they're eight foot tall. So, okay, I, I see what you did now. So um, a, a lot of it, you know, it's kind of unusual, but it's one of the highest yielding crops per acre per year. Um, there's been numbers up to 90,000 pounds per acre, but the average is more like 50 to 75,000 pounds of roots per acre per year. And that's just astounding numbers of, of food. And these are staple foods too. These are things that, that can sustain us. I mean, these make great breads and tortillas and baked goods and all kinds of cool stuff. We typically eat it like a potato substitute, so we're using it for soups. It makes an awesome french fry, probably one of the best french fries you've ever had. Um, it's great baked on pretty much everything a potato can be used for. This is my favorite new crop, is African potato mint. It's one that probably no one has really heard of ever. It's, it's uh, considered a lost crop of Africa. There's a great book called Lost Crops of Africa, and this is featured in there. There's two different species. It's related to coleus, a common landscaping, common landscaping plant, and um, you can see from its look, it's a very beautiful kind of lime green ground cover. It grows very tight and very dense. It's only about a foot tall, but it grows beautifully. It smothers out all the weeds. It really outcompetes weeds very well. Um, this year's our first year growing it, and we originally got cuttings from Baker Creek for about $5 for like a little tiny plug. And those little plugs in Florida, you put them in the ground, and within a year, you have enough plant material to make 10,000 plugs from. So it's a great return on investment in terms of buying the plant material. It's very expensive for one little cutting at first, but it grows so quickly, and it's a great crop to, uh, you know, to, to get a return on. So I have heard people are growing this out here in California. Someone mentioned earlier, I didn't write it down, but a nursery in the area that actually has this plant. So it's a great plant. Um, it yields a small potato, so it's, a, it's in the mint family. It doesn't actually taste like mint. We call it African potato mint because it's a mint relative. It's in the Lamiaceae family. But they're these little potatoes that are more similar to a nightshade, you know, an Irish potato. And uh, it's a very nutty taste, really rich. If you took the best fingerling potato and concentrated all the best flavors of that and the nuances and, you know, just made that more extreme and more flavorful, that's what this is. It's really delicious. It's a very, very good crop. It's so easy to grow. It's very drought tolerant. We didn't have a single pest issue with it. Nothing really seems to like the leaves at all. It's, it's 
very fleshy, almost like a succulent-like leaf. So it seems like it's a very drought-hardy crop, and uh, it's an excellent plant. So for us, it's one that there's not really a ton of market for the root yet. It's just so rare, but it's more of a specialty crop, and, and chefs love these type of things. So it's great for plating. It's got a small root, you know, packed in flavor, something unusual. Um, but it's similar enough that you're not having to convince someone to try some weird food. It's, it's a potato, basically, and, it, and it's really, really good. The yields of this are a lot lower than some of the other root crops because there's been very little work done with it. There's not been a lot of selection done. So it's more like 10 to 15,000 pounds per acre per year. And there's some different varieties that have shown some more promising results with higher yields per acre. But it's a great plant for your food forest. It's a great ground cover. It does great around fruit trees. It's a very shallow root system. It's not very invasive to your roots of your fruit trees. Um, it's more like a 100 to 150 day crop. So it's a great one to put out in the springtime and get a fall harvest on. So we're typically selling the, the nursery plants. We're doing them from cuttings or small tubers. And we're selling those for about $7 a piece. And they take about two months to root out. So it's a really quick return on, on doing this nursery work with these. So true yams. Um, all of you have heard of yam. Most people confuse yam with sweet potato. Um, in the South, a lot of sweet potato varieties are called yams. True yams are totally unrelated to sweet potato. They're in the Dioscoria family which is you know, pretty far, you know, pretty distantly related to sweet potato. So true yams grow up like on a trellis or a tree, and sweet potatoes grow on the ground like a ground cover. So you plant yams by a, a bulbule, which is an aerial tuber that's made, or by a piece of the main tuber, and they're very fast growing. Yams are the largest root vegetable on earth. Um, there's been yams that have reached 180 pounds a piece. So one giant potato that's 180 pounds. And those, are, those big ones are typically in volcanic soils, in the Pacific Islands and Polynesia and these kind of places. But I've personally harvested yams. This vine right here, the yam was about 90 pounds off of. So a giant potato. And the cool thing is you can cut a piece off of it and it lasts for four months. So when you cut the potato, it heals itself almost right away. It calluses that cut over. So they can stay unrefrigerated for four months and just, it's amazing. It's pretty crazy. So yams don't have a real high value either, but they have a high production. So they can produce up to 90,000 pounds of food per acre per year. And uh, that, that's just astounding. That's a lot of, of staple crop. Um, like I said, these are typically done from tubers or aerial divisions. We're currently not selling yams because it's actually restricted in Florida. They do so well, it's invasive. A lot of these root crops have the potential to become invasive because the tubers are very pervasive. Once they're established, they're hard to get rid of. You can, you can cut it back, and it's going to come right back year after year. So... A lot of varieties of yams, even though some have not shown invasive tendencies, they're all kind of blanketed as illegal in Florida. So they're category one invasives. But we still have a few growing, you know, so we, we, we're very careful to manage them in a way. But they're already naturalized in our area. So yams, if you go into any of the woods around us, the, the winged yam, Dioscoria lata, is already naturalized all over the place. And you can go out there and harvest giant yams out of the woods, so... Moringa is one that uh, many of you have heard of before. Moringa is the most nutritious terrestrial crop on earth. Moringa has an unreal nutrient value. It's one of the fastest growing plants on earth. Moringa in Florida grows up to 20 feet in its first year from seed. So it's extremely fast growing. It's very high yielding. It has extremely high market value. Um, Moringa right now sells for up to $80 a pound for the dry leaf. And so you can get a plant that grows 20 foot in a year and can yield, you know, 50,000 pounds per acre per year of fresh leaf. You know, it's a great, great crop. So in terms of its nutrient content, it blows pretty much everything else out of the water. Kale and spinach and these things just pale in comparison to Moringa. Moringa per 100 gram serving has 10 times the vitamin C content of oranges. It has four times the vitamin A content of almonds, sorry, of, of uh, carrots, four times the vitamin E content of almonds, twice the iron of spinach, twice the calcium of milk, twice the protein of yogurt, um, 67 different antioxidants. Um, it's just unreal. It's just full of nutrients, full of minerals. It's very easy to grow. Every part of the plant's edible except for the wood itself. So the roots are edible, the leaves are edible, the seed pods are edible. The mature seeds can be pressed for an oil that's as high quality as olive oil. Um, the mature seeds, after they're pressed, that seed meal can be used as a flocculent to purify dirty water. So you can actually take dirty pond water and take moringa meal, a seed meal, put it in the pond water, and all the, the, the filth just instantly settles out. It's, it's called a flocculent. Then you can boil that clean water off. So in areas that, that you don't have any ability to filter water, this is a great plant to grow for that purpose as well. Um, overall, it's just an astounding plant. The, 
the fresh leaves can go for up to 16 bucks a pound. They can be pretty much harvested in South Florida and warmer areas like Hawaii year-round. In Central Florida, they don't really produce a harvestable crop during the wintertime. It kind of slows down. doesn't really make a lot of leaves. Um, the seeds can be harvested at, at a state like a green bean, and those yield around 30,000 pounds of beans per acre per year, which is pretty crazy as an additional crop. And the, the bean crop is managed differently than the leaf crops. So if you're growing it for high bean production, you're not cutting the tree back. The tree, when grown for leaf, is, is typically coppiced. So in the first year, you let the tree grow up to about 10 or 15 feet, then you cut it back hard to about a foot off the ground. And then after that point, once it's reached a decent caliper, you keep it coppiced to keep it low and harvestable. So longevity spinach is one of my favorite leaf crops. It's a ground cover, and uh, it's very easy to start. We started from cuttings, and it's an awesome plant because it can grow in the sun, it can grow in partial shade, it can grow in nearly full shade. And the neat part about it is it's harvestable in Florida every single day of the year. So it can take frost, it can take 90 degrees, 100 degrees, it can take 10 inches of rain in a week, it can take drought. It's a pretty incredible crop, and it's called longevity spinach because it's one of the most nutritious medicinal plants out there. It's a very important crop in Southeast Asia, and um, it's typically eaten fresh or stir-fried or in soups or any kind of uh, you know, boiling, steaming, all that kind of stuff works out great for it. And um, typically takes a couple months from a cutting to, to harvest the plant. And after that point, it spreads out into a nice ground cover and just produces leaves year-round. So my favorite way to harvest it is the tips. The growing tips of a lot of these tropical plants, moringa and sweet potato, and a lot of these things that I'm saying you can eat the leaves of, the tip, the, the growing tip, the most succulent fresh growth, is typically the best part. And when you go to the traditional growing regions of these plants, like in Southeast Asia and Africa and these kind of places, the tips are, the, are typically the most gourmet part of the plant. So in the longevity, you harvest that new growth tip, almost like an asparagus, and it's crunchy and it's tender and it's just packed in, in texture and flavor, and it's delicious. So we, we do these from cuttings, and um, we typically sell the cuttings for seven bucks a piece, and a couple months from a cutting, they're ready to sell. They make a really nice ornamental plant, really easy to manage. So a lot of you know about turmeric. Um, it's had a lot of buzz in the health food world. Turmeric for Florida is a great crop to grow. It's an excellent understory plant. It's very adaptable. It does well in full sun. It also yields great in shade, too. Um, it likes a higher organic content in the soil, but it can grow in fairly poor soils, too. Um, turmeric's got a very high market value. The root often sells for up to $20 a pound retail in the health food world for organic turmeric. And every place I've talked to, uh, I've approached with selling turmeric, every place wanted it. And they want as much as possible as you can give it to them. So it's a great crop. There's a very uh, high demand for it right now, and not a lot of people growing it. So it's one that we're planting more and more of. So yeah, like I said, it's very expensive, 10 to $20 a pound. Um, we're selling the nursery plants for 10 bucks a piece. It's a little piece of turmeric we put in the ground. And in three months, you have a nice plant, and it's very ornamental. It's in the ginger family, so it's a really beautiful plant. I'm going to skip over a couple of these. I'm running a little behind. Go to some of my... I'm going to talk about a few of my favorite ones. I skipped over a couple of the spices, because there's a little, a little more exciting for me to talk about jackfruit. I did a talk last night at the California Rare Fruit Growers, and my other thing besides perennial vegetables is, is rare fruit. That's really my, my big passion. Um, jackfruit is the largest tree-borne crop on earth. Like the yam, jackfruit makes an astounding amount of food. Um, there's been jackfruits recorded to be 180 pounds a piece. So the largest jackfruits I've seen in Florida are 80 or 90 pounds, which is still like a torpedo-sized fruit, just massive. And um, like the uh, moringa, every part of the jackfruit's edible except for the roots and the wood itself. So you can eat the leaves, you can eat the fruit when they're immature, you can eat the flowers, you can eat the, the fruit when it's mature and green as a vegetable, you can eat the ripe fruit, the fruit itself, when it's ripe, it's kind of like a, um, people compare it often to the bubble gum or juicy fruit gum, and it's been said that juicy fruit gum got its flavor from jackfruit originally. Um, it's got kind of a banana, pineapple, mango flavor to it. It's really exotic, really delicious. It's great raw, great for desserts. The neat part about it, it also has a seed inside of each piece of fruit. It's kind of like a pomegranate. It's a composite fruit. When you cut it open, there's all these, what are called arils. They're individual sections of fruit. And um, inside of those, those arils, those delicious arils, there's these seeds the size of a chestnut, and it tastes just like a chestnut, and it's very nutritious and very edible. I've actually taken the seeds and roasted them, ground the seed, mixed it with butter, and made a crust, made a dough. Then I took the fruit, the ripe fruit, and made a filling, and made almost the entire pie just out of one fruit. So the crust and the filling are from one fruit. 
pretty incredible plant. Jackfruits can yield up to 1,000 pounds of fruit per plant per year. So it's a great plant to sell, um, great fruit to sell. They you know, pretty much typically get a dollar to three dollars a pound for them. And um, at three dollars a pound, you're talking about a hundred pound fruit. It can be very expensive. So you really got to know what, you, what you're getting into when you buy a jackfruit. That's why a lot of people are selecting for smaller size jackfruits. The really big fruit are a little bit intimidating to people who aren't familiar with jackfruit. So we're personally trying to select for smaller jackfruit. And that's kind of the, the trend in Florida is, you know, smaller and smaller jackfruit. So our favorite ones now are more like in the five to 10 pound range. They're a little bit more manageable. You don't have to cut it outside on, on a cleaning table. I often relate jackfruit, cleaning a jackfruit to like cleaning a hog. I mean, it's a very messy fruit. They have sap coming out of it. You got to have a big knife. You know, it's, it's really like uh, butchering. <laughs> so jackfruits grow extremely fast. And despite the fact that they're the largest tree borne crop on earth, they're one of the most precocious fruit trees, one of the fastest bearing fruit trees from seed. There's been jackfruits recorded in Florida literally within one year from planting a seed have made fruit. Uh, there's been many cases recorded, though, where within two years from seed, you're getting a 15-foot tree making three or four fruit that are 30 or 40 pounds. And every year, the production increases and increases and increases. You know, for, really, the lifespan of these trees is you know, 100 years or more. So they're, they're very productive. A mature jackfruit tree in, in the proper climate in, in India and places in Southeast Asia can produce multiple thousands of pounds of fruit per year. But in Florida, the, number, the highest I've seen is 1,000 pounds per year, which is still just absolutely mind-boggling. So the last plant I'm going to finish up with is baobab. So we talked about you know, the largest root crop, the largest tree-borne fruit, the largest overall perennial vegetables are kind of tied between baobab and bamboo. So baobab's an African tree. The main one that's used for a vegetable is Adansonia digitata. And these are the giant you know, classic trees you see in you know, the Lion King and, and Discovery Channel, these giant African trees. And it's one of the most nutritious leaves on earth. And it also makes a, a fruit pod that's one of the most nutritious fruits out there. It has one of the highest vitamin A contents and uh, highest vitamin C contents as well. So it's a pretty incredible tree. Um, this is actually at my old place I lived in Fort Myers. And this was a, one that was planted, you know, 100 or more years ago. And that tree was about 12 feet across the base of the trunk. So in Africa, they can get 40 or 50 feet across. And there's actually trees where steps have been created into the tree to walk your way up to, to the canopy to be able to harvest leaves year-round. So the leaves are typically eaten uh, fresh, um, steamed. They're not really edible raw. They're typically steamed or made into soups and uh, pretty cool plant. The main commercial importance of baobab, though, is the fruit itself. The fruit pod's been classified as a superfood. It's used a lot in you know, health food stores, smoothies, all these kind of things. And it's selling for 15 to, I've seen up to $30 a pound for, for the fruit pulp. So that's pretty much it for me. Um, we've reached our time mark here. So I'm going to open it up for a couple questions. I know we're pretty short on time, but uh, does anyone have any questions? How big does the baobab tree before it produces fruit? Before it produces fruit? They're pretty slow to produce fruit. Um, typically, it's up, up, I've heard up to 15 years um, for, for good fruit production. So, and there's not a lot of plant material available, and there's not a lot of information available on baobab, because typically they're harvested wild, most of the fruit. Any other questions? One hundred percent. Yeah, a lot of these crops can be grown as an annual. Um, sweet potato is one that's grown all the way up into Maine. I've seen, and probably even into Canada, as an annual. So some of them have too long of a season to be able to grow. Like cassava takes too long to grow as an annual. But longevity spinach could be a great annual that you can grow and bring inside. Um, you know, turmeric, lemongrass. A lot of these things that I that I mentioned can all be grown as an annual or a you know bring inside during the like for us. In, in North Florida, if we're talking to clients, you can grow cassava, but it might freeze hard enough where it'll kill the plant. Um, so you can actually plant it early enough in the spring to get a harvest out of some of the shorter season varieties before the frost. Take cuttings in, put them in the barn during the wintertime. The cuttings last for about three months inside. Take them back outside, stick them out in the spring, and you're fine. So <clears throat> any other questions? All right, well, thanks a lot.